Now, as we have made our way through the first letter of John on these Sunday evenings for some time now, in fact, I gather from those who make the tapes that this is the 13th occasion that we have been studying 1 John. We have found that there are really two themes, one subsidiary to the other. The first great theme, which we have used as our title for this series, is that 1 John really deals with the subject of true Christian assurance. Captured for us in the words of verse 13 of this fifth chapter, where John tells us why he has written the epistle, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, the subsidiary themes of 1 John are the three evidences of that spiritual life in any Christian believer. And several times over, we have found John coming back to these three evidences. They are the evidences of Christian belief, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, and recognizing in him the only Savior of sinners. That's the first evidence of true Christian life. The second is an, a social rather than a doctrinal test, and it is this. John says if you have this true life, you will love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Love them, that is, by putting them first in your life and interests. And this is one of the tests of genuine spiritual experience. And the third is a moral test that we might obey what God has commanded us to do. Now, these three tests John comes back to again and again. The illustration that I've used several times of it is not an illustration that's novel to me, but was first uh, put forward by Robert Law last century. It's the illustration of a spiral staircase. And he, who has written, incidentally, one of the best commentaries on 1 John, called the tests of life, he says that as you go through the epistle, it's almost like winding your way up a spiral staircase. You keep seeing the same things at a different level and from a different perspective. And that is very true of 1 John, and we have discovered it. So we have been looking through these weeks past at these three tests of genuine Christian assurance. The doctrinal test, the social test, and the moral test. You will notice that they also cover almost every area of life. The first is Godward in its direction. The fruit of Genuine Christian experience is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. The second is manward in its direction. The fruit of genuine Christian experience is loving our brothers and sisters in Christ with all the content in that word that the New Testament brings. And the third is, of course, inward in its direction. It deals with the whole issue of our obedience to God. Now, you see in these five verses that we read this evening that John is not singling out any one of them, but rather at this point in the letter brings all three of them together. And you will notice the doctrinal test of what we believe is in verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And the second or social test is in the second half of verse 1. 
Everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God. And then the moral test comes immediately afterwards, at the end of verse 2 and in verses 3 and 4. Loving God is twinned with carrying out His commands. This is love for God, to obey His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. Now, the thing at this point that links these three marks of Christian experience together for John is very significantly the new birth. That experience of which John records Jesus' conversation for us in chapter 3 of the Gospel with this man Nicodemus the Pharisee, to whom Jesus says, you must be born again. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now notice how John expresses these tests in verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So how do you know that you're born of God, born from above, born again? The New Testament uses all these expressions. The answer is, you will believe savingly in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of the evidences of the new birth. And how do you know that you are born again? Well, says John, one of the marks of being born again is that you will love the brethren. How do you know that you are born again? The third mark of the new birth is that you will obey God. You will have a new nature given to you by God, and you will obey Him. Now, just as there are marks of being born into a particularly human family, there are marks of being born into the family of God. We often are able to recognize people and which family they belong to by certain lineaments in their features or in their life or mannerisms sometimes that they have. And we say, we know where he got that from. It's something that derives from the family likeness. Now, if that's true in the physical world, it is more abundantly true in the spiritual world. There are birthmarks that belong to the people of God. And you can tell whether they have experienced the new birth or no. And John is giving us these three ways that you can know if you are truly born again. And here's the first of them in the first half of verse 1. If you are born again, you will have saving faith in Jesus Christ. Everyone, says John, who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now, what he is simply identifying as an evidence of new birth is that when we are born into the family of God, one of the first evidences of it is that there is created in us saving faith by which we recognize in Jesus Christ the only Savior of sinners and reach out our hand to receive His mercy and His salvation and rest ourselves on Him 
as our only Savior and our only hope in this world and in the world to come. Now that is an evidence of the new birth. May I just point out to you that it is not the cause of the new birth. We are not born again because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how John puts it. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, and that's a present tense, Everyone who is believing that Jesus is the Christ, that is, if you are sitting here in church tonight and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll tell you why it is that you do. It is because you have been, and that's past tense, born of God. So the evidence of the new birth is Saving faith. Now, why is that important? It's important for this reason. That before you are born again, you do not have spiritual life. Before you are born from above, you are unable to exercise any spiritual activity. You are incapable of believing in the Lord Jesus Christ because... You are, as Paul puts it, dead in trespasses and sins. And what happens when you are born anew is that you are enabled to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2 describes faith as the gift of God. It is an evidence that until in His great mercy God comes and raises us up into newness of life in Jesus Christ, we are totally incapable of any spiritual activity. And when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will believe that He is truly and fully man as God has revealed Him, that He is truly and fully God in His nature and being, that He is the only sin-bearer who can take away your sin and you will rest yourself, therefore, on Jesus. The reason that that's related, of course, to the new birth is not only that I need to be resurrected or given new life in order to believe. It is, as Jesus said, that until a man is born again, there are two things that he cannot do. He cannot see the kingdom of God. He is blind. And the condition of multitudes of men and women around us in the world today, with whom we are rubbing shoulders in our daily work, is that they are blind to the glory and beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is why they do not believe in Him. They see no beauty in Him. They see nothing in Him that they would desire Him, as the prophet Isaiah prophesied to us 800 years before Christ came. They are blind to the glory of Jesus. Not only so, but they are incapable of entering the kingdom. Go back to John 3 and read it for yourself sometime. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, this inability of the sinner to do anything for himself of eternal value 
is one of the most vital things for us to grasp. Why so? For the sake of our evangelism, my friends. What are we doing in evangelism? We are not persuading sinners to save themselves because they cannot. We are persuading them that they are utterly helpless and hopeless until God in His grace comes and brings them to new birth in Jesus Christ. Who then can initiate a work of grace? I tell you, only God Himself. That's why we cannot plan the conversion of people. We need to pray for it. Now, don't imagine that I'm saying you must not engage in evangelism. God helping me, I try to do that every day of my life, and I hope you do. But you need to know that the only one who can save is God Himself. And until He opens the blind eye, until He unstops the deaf ear, until He gives life to the dead, they will know nothing of the kingdom of God. So John says, everyone who has believed that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now let me turn that round a little bit and say this to you. Are you aware this evening of resting your eternal well-being on Jesus Christ? Say you and I were able to leave everybody else in this church and we were able to go into a room and I were to say to you when you asked me concerning your own eternal well-being, the assurance that you need and don't have, I would want to ask you, if you were to tell me this evening, where do you rest your hope for eternal glory? On whom are you trusting for your salvation? Where are you resting your confidence for the forgiveness of all your sin and the cancelling out of all your guilt? If you say to me, I am resting on Jesus Christ, I have cast myself, my sin, my defilement upon Jesus only. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I would say to you, my dear friend, you have the marks of the new birth. Go home assured that you are Christ's. For that's the evidence that the New Testament tells us to look for. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So there's the first birthmark of true Christian assurance and of true Christian living. It is saving faith. And here's the second. It's in the second half of verse 1 and into verse 2 it is the mark of brotherly love. Everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. If you are born into a physical family, a human family, you find two things that are normal to human nature. The absence of them is a distortion of human nature. 
The first is parental love. You see the evidences of that from earliest days in a child's life. There is parental love. But the second is brotherly love or family love. It is a natural thing for a child to love a parent. But it is also a natural thing for a child to love others who are in the same family. Everyone who loves the Father, says Jesus, loves his child as well. Just think for a moment of the possibility of the absence of this and of your observing in a human family members of the same family who to other people are disloyal to one another, express hatred rather than love, betray one another, neglect one another, are disinterested in one another. Now, these are the marks of some gross distortion in ordinary human families. The same would be true, of course, in the Christian family. And as we would say in a human family, there's something very unnatural about that behavior. We would say in the family of God, there is something very unspiritual about that behavior. Because everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. Of course, we have found already in First John that this love is not a love that is confined to God's people. The love that God sheds abroad in our hearts goes out as God's love goes out far beyond His own people. But like God's love, it has a special focus upon His own people. This is why one of the things that people yearn for when they are away in another part of the world is Christian fellowship. They want to have the society, the presence, the conversation, the company of other believers. And something flows out of their hearts. They find themselves knit to one another. You get two sisters or two brothers or a brother and sister in an ordinary family, and you say to them, Now, why in the world do you behave like that to each other? Why do you care for one another as you do? Why are you ready to sacrifice for one another as you are? Because they will be. And their answer to you would be, what a ridiculous question. That's my nature, because he's my brother, she's my sister. And it's part of what I am, that I feel for them something I feel for nobody else. Now, amongst the people of God, that, my friends, ought to be true. This is how we know that we love God when we love the brethren with a small b. And that's a very important thing for us to recognize. There is a unity of heart and mind, a care that goes out 
to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, you see this in the early church, don't you? What happened in the early church? Well, there were people like Barnabas, who cheerfully and gladly sold land that he had and property and possessions. Why did he do it? He did it because he looked and saw his brothers and sisters in special need, and he gladly put it aside and said, sell that in order that they may be cared for. Now, sometimes the easiest thing is to sell your goods and give the money. Sometimes the more costly thing is when you have nothing to sell or it would be inappropriate and you have to give yourself to people. Now, you know how this ought to happen in every proper human family. And my dear friends, it ought to happen in the church of Jesus Christ. It is one of the marks of spiritual birth, saving faith and brotherly love. I was greatly impressed when a friend of mine told me of how he had someone who came to him months after his first initial contact with this particular fellowship told him he had been brought to new life in Christ in this place. He had come in from outside. Here he was in this strange fellowship. He had never been in it before. He had hardly ever been in church before. And when he came in and began to share in the evening worship, it's quite a small company of people. He told the minister this time afterwards, it wasn't anything that you said. I don't even remember what you preached on, he said. Always a deflating thing for anybody to hear. But he said, I tell you what it was. As I moved around these people, I was a needy man when I came in here. My heart was broken. My life was in tatters. My future seemed precisely nil. And here I found love. It was as though I was being embraced in this fellowship. And he said, if ever in my life I felt a love that came from another world, I felt it there. And my friend Peter Brumby, because it was in his church in Whitby, said, I thank God for that sign of His grace that you have just described to me. And I want to say to you that it's a mark of spiritual birth, and the absence of it is probably more serious than we think. But there is a third mark, third birthmark of the people of God, and it's at the end of verse 2 and expounded in verses 3 to 5. He says, this is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out His commands. This is love for God. What is love for God? To obey His commands. So loving God's children and loving God and obeying God's commands all go together in God's mind. Now, we have often found previously what we read this evening in John chapter 14, as Peter read it to us, do you remember? How do you know that you love God? In this is the love of God. This is how you know that you love God, by keeping His commandments. Now, the knowledge of the love of God, the assurance of the love of God, is not an emotional thing, you see. I keep being deeply impressed by what John Stott has written about this, and I was quoting it in another connection this morning. The true Christian love 
is not the victim of our emotions, but the servant of our will. Now that's something that we greatly need to pick up and remember. We often imagine that love for God is an emotional high, you know, that we have. Actually, it's demonstrated simply because we do what he tells us. That's how you know that somebody loves God. If somebody says, I do love the Lord Jesus Christ, the way you know they love the Lord Jesus Christ is if they obey his commandments. And that's precisely what John is telling us. But he goes on to add two further things, do you notice, in this elaboration from verse 3. This is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. That's the first thing. Obeying God for the believer is a blessing, not a burden. Here's the second. Obeying God for the believer is a glorious possibility and not a depressing impossibility. Notice, his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. That is the opposition. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Obeying God for the believer is a glorious possibility and not a depressing impossibility. Let me say a word to you about each of these uh, as we draw to a close. His commands are not burdensome. Now, I need to spend a moment on that with you because it's something of which we need convinced. Most of us have a secret conviction, deeply held but seldom confessed, that the commandments and the laws of God are somehow limiting in our lives, impoverishing in our experience, and cramping us in a way that is going to make us miserable. Because the ultimate lie of the devil is that the will of God is hard, that the will of God is going to bring you into some kind of misery, Whereas the New Testament testimony is that the will of God is good and perfect and acceptable. That it is tailor-made for your life. That nothing else will fit you except the will of God. And that's what John means when he says the commandments of God are not burdensome. And the psalmist, bless him when he discovers this, says, Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation day and night. It's sweeter than honey to me. When did you last say that? When did you last feel that? When did you last bow in the presence of God, seeking his will for your life and say, Lord, your will is perfect. Mine is duff, but yours is perfect. And therefore, I'm going to run to do your will, O oh my God. You ever feel that? Well, I tell you, that's the truth. Everything less than that is a lie. And that's what John means when he says his commandments are not burdensome. But moreover, obeying God for the believer is a glorious possibility, not a depressing impossibility. Notice what John says. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And every one born of God overcomes the world. Now, what that means very simply is this. That God has not only set us to obey His will and to refuse the will of the world and all that that means. 
including the flesh and the devil. He has empowered us by his grace, setting within us his very Holy Spirit in order that we might overcome the world. Notice how he puts it in John 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. He says, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And therefore, you have the power dwelling within you of the God who raises the dead. And as Howard Marshall, professor of New Testament in Aberdeen, perfectly puts it, anybody who can defeat death can defeat anything. And the one who lives in you, if you're born anew, you have the life of God in the soul of man. You have the one who defeated death. Now, what's your problem this evening? What's the difficulty? Where are the trials and aches and burdens within your soul? I want to say to you, the one who defeated death dwells in you. And if he defeated death, he can defeat anything. And that's why the glorious possibility of living a life conformed to the will of God is a reality for the Christian believer. Because Christ is in you, the hope of glory. You grasp that wonderful thing? That in the end of the day is the ultimate evidence of life. In me, Christ dwells so that I can say with Paul, Christ lives in me and the life I now live by faith in the Son of God is the life that you and I can live by the same grace with the same indwelling Savior. May God lift up our hearts and send us out into the world with true Christian assurance. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, grant us, we pray, your hand upon us, your word in our hearts, your Holy Spirit empowering and enabling us that we may live to please and glorify you for the glory of your name. Amen.